Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you are all well uh, and looking forward to a brand new session of reading. So we're going to be continuing on the book that we read yesterday, um, Edward Tulane. Um, but before we get into that, we need to have a quick recap of the eight vocabulary words that we looked at yesterday. Um, so I'm going to say the word and we're going to do just like we did yesterday. I'm going to say the word and I want you to do the action back towards the computer, please. As strange as it is, even if you're with your whole family or whether you're all by yourself, make sure that you're doing those actions because that's going to really help those stick in your head to make sure that you can remember those words for future times when you want to include them in your speech or in your writing. Um, so I'm going to go through them in any order. Just clear your mind. Think of what the words were and what the actions were as well. So let's start with custom. Custom, which in this case means exactly as you ordered it. So custom. Hopefully we're seeing a lot of OK signs. Remember, perfectly made. So you might order a custom car. Um, and choose that we talked about yesterday, talking the choosing the leather seats uh, and choosing what color you're going to have it painted. So custom um, penetrate. Hopefully loads of people jabbing towards the laptop screen without poking my face on the other side. Good. So penetrate, which means to pierce or to go through something. Um, now, the first word we looked at jaunty. Jaunty. Remember, if you're, fit, if you're uh, walking in a jaunty way, you have a lot of confidence. You might have a tip of your hat, which is what we did. Jaunty. Um, requested. Hope I felt a lot of wind there from all of you guys shooting your arms straight into the air. Re requested the act of asking for something, just like you would in the classroom, requesting something by putting your hand up first. Um, what about condescending? Condescending. What? You don't know what the word condescending is? Remember when you're speaking as if you're superior. You, what do you mean you don't know? Because you think you're sort of more intelligent or more powerful than someone else. So a nasty way to act. So remember, we're sort of looking down at someone and saying, condescending. Have a bit of attitude in there. Good. So condescending, which is when you're suggesting that you're superior or better to someone. Um, quite similar to this. Unsavory unsavory if you were so hopefully we're seeing a lot of disgusted faces here as if you've eaten something really nasty or heard something really nasty Ugh. unsavory which is distasteful or maybe something that's offensive um and i believe the oh no there's a couple more to go um how about uh, commissioned Commissioned, which is the last one we looked at yesterday. If you have something commissioned, remember you're employing someone, you're paying someone to perform that task. So my favorite action, remember we had that pile of money, we're paying someone to do a job. So we're commissioning them to do something. And finally, initially, initially, hopefully loads of ones pointed at the screen because initially means at first or at the beginning of something. Well done. Excellent, guys. So hopefully you've remembered those words. Um, before we crack into uh, the next bit of Edward Tulane um, and the literal questions, what I would like you to do is the vocab activity. So I'm going to share my screen here. And hopefully you can see this in front of you now. So um, a shout out to someone in Newcastle class. Could I borrow your pencil? Lily requested. Now, what you have to do is look for the word in bold. So in that case, the, in this case, it's requested and replace it with a synonym so that it makes sense. I'll give you a second to think, what does the word synonym mean? So synonym is a word that is similar to or means the same as. So you're looking for a word that means the same as or something similar to requested so that the sentence still makes sense. So could I borrow your pencil, Lily requested? So what does requested mean? What does it, what is it similar to? Well, it means that you're asking for something. So you could say, you could write down here, asked. Um, but I'm sure many of you will be able to think of some more exciting examples than that. Um, but all you need to do, no need to write out the full sentence, just write the one word that 
um, is a synonym to the word in bold. And there are four of those to do uh, to do here. And then we'll go through some other suggestions after that. So feel free to pause the video now and resume it once you've finished that vocab activity. Just a few minutes to do that, I think. OK, so hopefully you've completed that vocab activity now. Um, so let's go through some of the answers that you could have done. So could I borrow your pencil? Lily requested. I said asked, which is fine. It makes sense, but it's a bit boring. Hopefully you guys came up with some more examples. You could say Lily begged if she really, really wanted the pencil. Uh, questioned you could have as well and loads of others. Um, that meal left an unsavory taste in my mouth. Remember using those actions to help you. Unsavory, what does that mean again? Oh yeah, it kind of means sort of disgusting, not very nice. So that meal left a, you could have disgusting taste in my mouth. Uh, that meal left an unpleasant taste in my mouth. Uh, that meal left nasty taste in my mouth. Um, then on to number three, initially, what does initially mean again? Thinking of the action. Oh yes, number one, isn't it? means first of all. So firstly, I feared spiders, but now I can hold them without a problem. So we could do some, anything that shows that it's at first. So at first, firstly, to begin with, or in, um, something like that. Um, and then the cold was not able to penetrate my winter coat. So meaning that it wasn't able to kind of get through and make me feel cold. So what does penetrate mean? Of course, oh yeah, it means to pierce something. So you could have the cold was not able to pierce my winter coat. It was not able to puncture my winter coat, to, um, to infiltrate my winter coat, perhaps. Loads of ideas that you could have had there. Um, the last one probably being the hardest to come up with. Well done, guys. So before we move on to our literal questions, we're going to have a read through again of the, um, of the uh, Edward Tulane chapter one that we looked at yesterday. So again, if you've got the text in front of you, then great. If not, just use the one that I've got on the screen. And when we get to one of these um, highlighted words, see if, just to the computer, see if you can remember what the action is and just do it to me on the, uh, at the, on the computer screen um, like that, even though I can't see you. I like to feel that you're, you're all doing those. So, Edward Tulane, chapter one. Once in a house on Egypt Street, there lived a rabbit who was made almost entirely of China. He had China arms and China legs, China paws and a China head, a China torso and a China nose. We did mention what torso means, remember? It's the sort of top half of your body that your arms sort of come out of, your chest and stomach area. Um, his arms and legs were jointed and joined by wire so that his China elbows and China knees could be bent, giving him much freedom of movement. His ears were made of real rabbit fur and beneath all the fur, there were strong bendable wires, which allowed the ears to be arranged into poses that reflected the rabbit's mood. Jaunty, tired, full of ennui. His tail too was made of real rabbit fur and fluffy and soft and well-shaped. So hopefully a lot of you tipping your cap there um, for jaunty, meaning um, sort of full of confidence. Uh, the rabbit's name was Edward Tulane, and he was and he was tall. He measured almost three feet from the tip of his ears to the tip of his toes, and his eyes were painted a penetrating and intelligent blue. Remember, penetrating, meaning that they're really, really bright. They're almost able to pierce you. In all, Edward Tulane felt himself to be an exceptional specimen. Only his whiskers gave him pause. They were long and elegant, as they should be but they were of uncertain origin. So he wasn't sure where they came from. Edward felt quite strongly that they were not his, the whiskers of a rabbit. Whom the whiskers had belonged to initially, what unsavory animal, was a question that Edward could not bear to consider for too long. And so he did not. He preferred as a rule, not to think unpleasant thoughts. Edward's mistress was a 10 year old dark-haired girl named Abilene Tulane, who was thought almost as highly as Edward as Edward thought of himself. Each morning after she dressed herself for school, Abilene dressed Edward. The China rabbit was in possession of an extraordinary wardrobe composed of handmade silk suits, 
custom shoes fashioned from the finest leather and designed specifically for the rabbit feet and a wide array of hats. So loads and loads of hats equipped with holes so that they could easily fit over Edward's large and expressive ears. Each pair of well-cut trousers had a small pocket for Edward's gold pocket watch. Abilene wound this watch for him every morning. Now, Edward, she said to, to him after she had finished winding the watch, when the big hand is on the 12 and the little hand is on the three, I will come home to you. She placed Edward on the chair in the dining room and positioned the chair so that Edward was looking out of the window and could see the path that led up to the Tulane front door. Abilene balanced the watch on his left leg. She kissed the tips of his ears and then she left and Edward spent the day staring out at Egypt Street, listening to the tick of his watch and waiting. Of all the seasons of the year, the rabbit most preferred winter for the sun set early then and the dining room windows became dark and Edward could see his own reflection in the glass. And what a reflection it was. He really does love himself, very narcissistic, this rabbit. What an elegant figure he cut. Edward never ceased to be amazed by his own fineness. Sounds like me. In the evening, Edward sat at the dining room table with the other members of the Tulane family. Abilene, her mother and father, Abilene's grandmother, who was called Pellegrina. True, Edward's ears barely cleared the tabletop. And true also, he spent the duration of the meal staring straight ahead at nothing but the bright and blinding white of the tablecloth. But he was there, a rabbit at the table. Abilene's parents found it charming that Abilene considered Edward real and that sometimes requested that a phrase or story be repeated because Edward had not heard it. Papa, Abilene would say, I'm afraid Edward didn't catch that last bit. Abilene's father would then turn in the direction of Edward's ears and speak slowly, repeating what he had just said for the benefit of the China rabbit. Edward pretended out of courtesy to Abilene to listen, but in truth, he was not very interested in what people had to say. And also, he did not care for Abilene's parents and their condescending manner towards him. All adults, in fact, condescended to him. So they talked down to him. They didn't really treat him like one of the family. Only Abilene's grandmother spoke to him as Abilene did, and one and as one equal to one another. Pellegrina was very old. She had a large, sharp nose and bright black eyes that shone like stars. It was Pellegrina who was responsible for Edward's existence. It was she who had commissioned, remember paying for it to happen, his making. So it was Edward, it was, um, sorry, Abilene's grandmother who commissioned Edward to be made, so paid for him to be made. She who had ordered the, his silk suits and his pocket watch, his jaunty hats and his bendable ears, his fine leather shoes and his jointed arms and legs, all from a master craftsman in her native France. So native France, meaning where she was uh, born, where she came from. It was Pellegrina who had given him as a gift to Abilene on her seventh birthday. And it was Pellegrina who came in each night to tuck Abilene into bed and Edward into his. Will you tell us the story, Pellegrina? Abilene asked her grandmother each night. Not tonight, lady, said Pellegrina. When? asked Abilene. What night? Soon, said Pellegrina. Soon there will be a story. And then she turned off the light and Edward and Abilene lay in the dark of the bedroom. Ah, oh, I love you, Edward, Abilene said each night after Pellegrina had left. She said those words and then she waited, almost as if she expected Edward to say something in return. Edward said nothing. He said nothing because, of course, he could not speak. He lay in his small bed next to Abilene's large one. He stared up at the ceiling and listened to the sound of her breath, entering and leaving her body, knowing that soon she would be asleep because Edward's eyes were painted on and, she could, and he could not close them. He was wide awake. He was always awake, sorry. Sometimes if Abilene put him back into, into his bed, 
on his side instead of his back, he could see through the cracks in the curtains and out into the dark night. On clear nights, the stars shone and their pinprick light comforted Edward in a way that he could not quite understand. Often, he stared at the stars all night until the dark finally gave way to dawn. My word. So imagine, imagine not being able to have eyelids and just being awake the whole night. Um, I don't know if I'd quite enjoy that. I'm not sure about you. Um, so now that we've had a second read of that, please feel free, by the way, I know that I read it to you every day, but please um, make sure that you're reading it yourself, um, reading it um, out loud or at least in your head, um, just to make sure that you're getting a grasp of it as well. Um, so we are going to be looking at literal questions today. So literal questions, as we've been through week after week, is a question that you can find the meaning of in the text. So you don't really need to use much inference or much insight like you do in tomorrow's work. All the answers will be in the text for you. So we've got our regular steps to success up here and an example question that I'm going to go through. So the question is, during dinner, what did Edward look at? Page 16, it very helpfully tells us which page number. So what's my first step? Well, let's have a look over here. So number one, underline the key words in the question. So the key words are, of course, the words that I'm, which are going to help me answer the question. So during dinner, well, I think the fact that it's dinner time, that's going to be helpful because if I'm, if there's a paragraph about breakfast, I know that the answer is not going to be in there. So during dinner, what did Edward look at? Now, I could underline Edward because we're ultimately he's the one that's looking at something, but I'm not going to just because Edward is going to come up so often because he's even the title of the book. We're going to see Edward about five times a page. So that's not going to help us necessarily answer the question. However, look at is definitely something that we need. So I've underlined the keywords of the question. Now we're going to skim and we're going to scan the text for keywords. So we're going to look at page 16, which I'll turn on in a moment, and look for those keywords. Remember, however, that we're not necessarily going to find exactly the words dinner or look at. We might get different words. What are different words called? They're called synonyms for these words. So we can't just look for dinner and look at. We've got to look for similar words. So maybe instead of dinner, there might be meal or supper or um, or something like that, or food, perhaps. And then instead of look at, there might be words like gazed or stared or saw or something like that. So we've got to make sure that we're looking for those kinds of words. So I'm just going to turn on my visualizer, which hopefully you can see here, and I'm on page 16. So just to, um, to reframe, what was step two? Skim and start, scan the text for keywords. So we're going to look for dinner and look at, or any similar words. So we're going to go through. Okay, oh, we've got, so we've got meal I found here, which is similar to dinner. So now that I've found that, step three, what's step three now that I've found a key word? So we need to read around the keywords to see if it answers the question of what Edward was looking at during dinner. So I found the word meal. Um, oh, and we've also got staring, which is a synonym of looking at. So we've actually got two back to back. So we think this is where to go. So I'm going to start at the, at the beginning of this sentence, which is up here. True, Edward's ears barely cleared the tabletop. And true also, he spent the duration of the meal staring straight ahead at nothing but the bright and blight, uh, the, the bright and blinding white of the tablecloth. Well, this seems to answer our question perfectly. So, staring straight ahead at nothing but the blinding white of the tablecloth. So, we look back at our question and we're going to write our answer. And remember, full sentences, please. So I don't want to just see you guys writing tablecloth. As much as possible, answer as a full sentence. My the, the way I always see it is your answer should be so clear that I should be able to tell you what the question is just by looking at my answer. So instead of writing, if I wrote maybe 27th of April as the answer to a question, that could be the answer to anything. If I wrote 
a full sentence, Mr. Parker's birthday is on the 27th of April, what would the question be? Well, I'm guessing that the question would then be, when was Mr. Parker's birthday? So we want to make sure that our question, our answers are as clear as the questions. So, during dinner, front of the verbal, so we can remember our comma, Edward looked at the tablecloth. Are we done yet? No, there are some more steps to do. So, step four, does your answer make sense? During dinner, Edward looked at the tablecloth. Yep, that makes sense as a question. I've remembered my, um, my comma after my fronted adverb or my full stop capital letter, and it makes grammatical sense. And does it, really important, does it answer the question? During dinner, what did Edward look at? During dinner, Edward looked at the tablecloth. Yes, that you can see that directly answers the question. So I can say, good job, Mr. Parker, well done. So all of your questions will be down here. Um, hopefully you'll have that sheet printed out and you can see that for all the questions that require you uh, to write a full sentence I've written under here, which is only questions three, five and seven, you lucky things. The rest of them can all be done on the sheet. So feel free now to pause the video. I'm going to leave the steps to success up here as well so that you can use it. And there's also an extension if you feel like pushing yourself, which would be great to see. So when I'm on Seesaw later today, I would love not just to see the questions the, uh, that you've answered, but also an extension to pretend you're Edward, write a short diary entry about what you might dream about if you could finally sleep. So if you were finally given eyelids and able to sleep, what do you think Edward would dream about? So I'll leave these up here. Pause your, um, pause your screens until you've finished, and then we'll go through the answers in a moment. Best of luck, guys. OK, ladies and gents, so hopefully now if you've unpaused the video, you have finished and you're ready to go through some of the answers. So what material was Edward mainly made of? And remember, you can tick these as we go on. Um, so the answer for that, of course, is China. Um, what do we know about Edward's ears? Tick all the correct answers. So there are two correct answers here. They're made of real fur and they bend. Those are the two correct ones. They're not short. They say they're quite tall, actually, and they're not full of wax. Absolutely not. Question three. How tall is Edward? He is three feet tall. That was on page 14. Number four. Tick whether the statements below are true or false. So Edward thought he was special. Yeah, absolutely true. As we said, he's quite a narcissist. He loves himself quite a lot the way he looks and the way he is. So, yes, he does think he's special. Edward whis Edward's whiskers belong to a cat. That's false. They, you, we said that they belong to an unsavory animal or there was something that he, they definitely weren't a rabbit, but we don't know it's a cat, so we can't say that that's true. Um, Edward's shoes were made of the finest rubber. That is false as well. Um, number five, copy, uh, find and copy um, the word that shows Edward's trousers were tailored well. So the phrase is well cut, but hopefully you've written a nice full sentence there. Maybe something like uh, that says the um, the word that shows Edward's trousers were tailored well is well cut. That would be a perfect sort of full sentence. Uh, number six, what time did a um, Abilene tell Edward she would be back? Circle the correct answer. So. Uh, if you look at page 15, that says three o'clock. I think she says when the uh, the long hands at the 12 and the short hands at the three. So that would be three o'clock. Number seven, what did Pellegrina's eyes remind Edward of? We want a nice full sentence here. So hopefully Pellegrina's eyes reminded Edward of dark stars. And finally, number eight, match the correct statements together. So Abilene's parents should be matched with condescending because Edward thought they were quite condescending. They looked down at him. Pellegrina would match a, um, to commissioned Edward, so paid for him to be made. And finally, Edward can't speak or sleep. Now, any extensions that you've written, please make sure those go on Seesaw so that your class teacher, whether that be me, Miss Jones or Miss Boots, can read those. That would be fantastic. Um, I'm just going to close my screen now. Sorry, guys. 
Excellent. Um, yeah, as I said, please make sure you submit those to Cecil. Really looking forward to, uh, to, to seeing how you got on with those questions and your extensions as well. I um, hope you are enjoying the book and enjoying these reading sessions. Um, and I will um, see you again tomorrow. So thanks a lot, guys. See you later.